to the lovely as I look out into the lovely South Oxfordshire countryside I'd like to wish you all a very warm good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you happen to be today um, it's been wonderful to see such uh, a diverse um, or to have such a diverse and global audience uh, joining us today for this webinar. Um, it really, for me, illustrates the level of interest in many of the key issues that affect the research communication ecosystem in, the, in lower and middle income countries. So welcome um, this afternoon, this morning, this evening, uh, and I hope you enjoy the next hour. Uh, please note, as we've just heard, that this meeting is being recorded, uh, which means that it will be available after today for you to watch again. Um, or for you to share with your, your colleagues. Uh, you will all receive an email afterwards with a link to the recording and also be posted onto the Research for Life website. So my name is Andrea Powell um, and I act as the publisher coordinator for Research for Life. I'm going to be hosting the webinar this afternoon. waiting for my screen to respond. Right, okay, here we go. So the agenda for this afternoon, first of all, I know that many of you are already publisher partners with Research for Life, or you could be uh, users or librarians who help um, promote Research for Life in your countries. But we'll start off with a brief introduction about this initiative um, to set the scene. I'm then going to hand over to uh, Rob Johnson, who's going to talk about the landscape and situation analysis that was the main subject of today. Um, we're then going to move on to uh, invite Professor Edda Tandi Luoga from Tanzania to give her reflections on the report as it affects her work in, in her home institution, in her home country. Um, and then our last speaker of the day, Sean Harris, will be looking at the next phase in the, in the Research for Life review program, which is the user review. Finally, we will have time at the end for questions and answers. So please do use the chat facility if you have any questions that you'd like us to address at the end of the session. So just to repeat our speakers today, myself, Rob Johnson, who is the director and founder of Research Consulting, who carried out this analysis on behalf of Research for Life. Then Tandy from, uh, from uh, Tanzania, and Tandy is the current chair of Research for Life's user advisory group and Sean Harris, who's a communication specialist with INASP. So you will be seeing their faces over the course of the next hour. So a very brief introduction to Research for Life. I'm sure, as I say, many of you are very familiar with it already. And this slide um, makes me smile always when I show it because it's always out of date because we are adding new content to the Research for Life platform all the time. Um, but the programme aims to reduce the knowledge gap between industrialised countries and developing countries by providing affordable access to academic and professional resources. The subjects that are covered by Research for Life include pretty much anything, pretty much any research area um, that, uh, that you can think of. In fact, since its early days, when its original focus was very much on health and then agriculture, Research for Life has expanded its scope to include almost every uh, research discipline um, that you can think of. And indeed, in recent months and years, we've added content covering um, social sciences, uh, chemistry, physics, hard sciences, computer sciences. So it really is a very broad um, and all encompassing um, program. Research for Life is available in a range of countries, about 125 countries globally. Uh, on this slide, you can see, I hope you can see that um, some countries are colored in blue. Uh, those are the countries which receive free access to the content, and those that are colored in yellow receive low cost. So Group A countries of the free access, Group B countries receive low cost access. Who within those countries is, is eligible for access to Research for Life? Well, it's very much an institutional program. We don't, we, we don't work with individuals, we only work through institutions. And the range of institutions is quite broad, but they have one thing in common, which is that they are all non-profit um, entities. So we include universities, research organizations and institutes, government departments and offices, teaching hospitals and healthcare services, national NGOs, vocational training centers, national libraries, and so on. And there are other categories. Um, we have very strict eligibility criteria 
for, um, for, for providing access to research for life, um, but essentially all within this nonprofit research context. Within Research for Life, we still run five very focused subject specific programs. And on, on this slide, you can also see the, the name of the United Nations Agency that runs the program and provides the program management um, resources. So the Hinari program is coordinated and run by WHO, Agora by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, OARI by UNEP, ARDI, which is our innovation and technology program, is managed and coordinated by WIPO. And our most recent addition to the, um, the family, now um, a two-year-old program, GOALI, uh, which covers the law and the social sciences, and that's run by the International Labour Organization. So to set the context for this webinar today, one of the um, activities that we undertake within Research for Life is to carry out every five years an in-depth evaluation of how the programme is working, how it can be how it is experienced by its users and how it's experienced by those who participate. So we, we have traditionally split the review programme into two halves, one half looking at the um, internal aspects, the partnership and the infrastructure of Research for Life, and the other half looking at the user's experience. Well, this time around, we also agreed to commission a landscape analysis, which would give some external context to the overall programme. And this was very important given the many dynamic changes taking place in scholarly communication and in development research itself. So rather than just be an, an internally focused uh, review exercise, we wanted to make sure that we were taking into account some of the changes that are taking place uh, around the world as well. And the changes in, in the context uh, change, taking place in the world in which Research for Life operates. And we contracted research consulting to perform the landscape analysis and infrastructure review. Um, and INASP, who we'll hear from later, has been contracted to carry out the user experience review, um, and that's currently underway. So these three components, when taken together, when completed, will form the evidence base for the next five-year strategic plan for Research for Life. So when we have completed all three parts of the uh, review programme, we'll have a very good understanding of how the programme is working for the, the partners, for the users, and also we'll know and we'll have a better appreciation for some of the changes that are coming along and the, and the um, external, in, uh, external context in which, uh, in which we operate and, and to which we need to respond. The key findings of the first two reports, the, the infrastructure review and the landscape analysis, will be presented to the Research for Life General Partners meeting, which is taking place at the end of this month in about uh, two weeks time, 29th of July and further sessions on the 30th of July. Of course, uh, sadly, we're not able to meet in person this year. Um, we should have been hosted by the American Medical Association in Chicago. Instead, we're all going to be in our own bedrooms, um, uh, taking part in what will hopefully be a very uh, interactive and engaging session. So with that introduction, I'd now like to hand over to Rob, who's going to take us through the key findings um, of the landscape and situation analysis. Over to you, Rob. Thanks very much, Andrea. And uh, I think I now have control of the slides. We'll, we'll soon find out. Um, just to briefly introduce myself, so I'm, I'm Rob Johnson, I run a consultancy based in the, the UK, we're usually based at the U University of Nottingham's Innovation Park, which is pretty much smack in the middle of, of England, um, like many people currently working at home. But we do a lot of work looking at trends in, in research in, and also international development and in scholarly communication. So I think I was really excited to take on this project because it really brings together many different strands of the, the work that we that we do and we work in the UK but we also work uh, very much internationally particularly Africa and, and Asia in uh, in recent years so what I'm going to try to do is just give you a flavor of the the work that we've done and really paint a picture of the landscape that research and scholarly communication takes place in and clearly it's a landscape that's changed very rapidly in the last few months and I will I will touch on that um, now you can find the full report. Uh, there's a link in the chat, and we will put the link up on the screen. So I would encourage you to go and, and look at that for something that's much more detailed 
than what I'll share today, but I'll hope just to paint a picture of some of the, the key trends that we see shaping the research and scholarly communication landscape. So let's see if this works. Uh, there we go, yeah. So what were we looking to do with uh, the landscape analysis? The aims are as it sets out on the screen. So just to understand the key dynamics and recent changes within the research communication ecosystem and within research funding, with a focus on low and middle income countries, which is of course the, the, the parts of the world that Research for Life is, is looking to serve. In terms of how we did that, we use the mixed methodology, um, that's the sort of research term, essentially lots of different inputs to this work. A lot of it is desk-based research, looking at existing studies, articles, grey literature, also data sets, but then talking with a number of Research for Life partners globally. We ran a survey of those, those partners as well. And of course, this is an area we work in quite frequently as a, as a firm, so we had quite a lot of existing knowledge to, to bring to that. So in terms of what we've looked to do, it's quite challenging to make sense of you know, what's happening in the world and how does it make uh, impact research and scholarly communications. So what we've sought to do is break this down into sort of meaningful levels of analysis and look at different dimensions of that. So what I'm showing here is just a graphic taken from the report, which provides that sort of overview. So um, we've used a tool called PEST. Um, it's a pretty common external analysis tool. It stands for political, economic, social, and technological. You'll sometimes see legal and environmental added to that, but we've stuck with just the, just the four. So we've tried to look at trends under each of those four headings, and then we've broken that down into the three levels that you see on the screen. So what are the global mega trends that are shaping society, shaping the world? what's happening in the funding of research in and for lower middle income countries and then zeroing in on what are the key trends in scholarly communication in publishing which are perhaps most relevant for research for life so essentially we're starting at a very macro level and then we're getting down to a more detailed level to look at the particular trends in the, the world of publishing and scholarly communication so what I'm going to share with you today is just um, three sort of infographics or summary slides. Um, you can find all of these online at the, the link in the chat. And they just bring together in a very high level form the, the trends that are described in more detail in the report. So just to look at that global picture, now I would say all of this is very broad brush. You know, there'll be enormous regional, national and sub-national variations in what I've described. I hope much of what I say you will recognise in your own regions and contexts, but there may well be things that, that don't apply in a particular environment. So we're looking at the broad, the broad trends, um, but there's, as ever, there's exceptions to every rule. So just to pick out a, a few things on here, if we look at the kind of political landscape, I think the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, I hope many of you will be familiar with them. I think that's kind of the closest we have to a global agenda for development and in, full, in turn that is informing much research activity. So that does represent a kind of shared set of objectives and goals that the world is at least in, in theory working towards. But I think what you see under that political heading is a number of other factors that perhaps are anti-collaborative. So the sort of trends towards populism and nationalism, uh, particularly but not solely in high income countries, the impact that's had on, on global trade. So of course we've had a kind of a trade war between US and, and China, a bit of a war of words, and that was having an impact on uh, global confidence and trade even before COVID-19. And we are very much seeing a historic shift from the, the West towards the East, um, the rise of China in terms of its political influence. So there's a lot of change happening in the, in the global landscape. And as I say, our, our report was written largely before the, the pandemic, but I'll come back to a sort of update on what the pandemic has meant for this at the, the end of this presentation. So just moving on to the, the economic picture, again, at the time we were writing this, we had had a decade or so of you know, global growth, more or less, not evenly spread, but in most parts of the world, there has been global growth, uh, economic growth for, for a decade or so. But we've also seen growth in the inequality of, of wealth distribution globally. 
And we were already seeing some worrying signs in the world economy, uh, even before COVID-19 hit. So kind of increasing levels of public spending, that shift towards trade protectionism driven in part by the, the, by the political environment. So there were some slightly worrying signs at the time we were writing this. Of course, much of that has, has uh, translated into you know, a very challenging economic situation over the last few months. In terms of the, the social trends, there's been rapid population growth in low and middle income countries, whilst high income countries have sort of stabilized or, or even gone into decline in terms of population. We've also seen very rapid urbanization in, in recent years. So we're now at the stage where 60% of people in East Asia are living in cities, 40% in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's been a very rapid shift in, in recent years. And that has enabled a, a corresponding rise in literacy rates, in demand and take up of education, and very rapid growth in universities. So as it states there, there's been great, growing demand for higher education. So in theory, at least, the talent pool for research, so those highly educated people, the volume of them is, is growing. And the number of universities has also been growing almost, almost you know, um, globally across the world. Technologically, I mean, the fact that we can hold this, this webinar today and have so many people from so many regions around the world, I think is just testament to the, the spread of internet access, mobile communication, but it is still very uneven. So if you look at the United States, 88% of people have access to the internet. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's 25%. So we still see growing take up of internet and mobile technologies, but it remains very uneven. And we've also got, of course, new developments or, or developments that are coming to fruition, like artificial intelligence and big data. They're becoming mainstream in many parts of the world, in many industries and many parts of research. But I think there's a risk that these can become barriers to research in low and middle income countries. If you need to have a high level of technological infrastructure, if you need very fast bandwidths and so on to do research, what does that mean? For researchers in those parts of the world that don't have access to that technology or may not have the skills to, to take advantage of it. So there's many positive aspects to technology but there is a risk of a growing digital divide as well. And lastly I think there is a, a recognition in the political sphere that, that research is important and so we're seeing a much greater connectivity between research and technological development and uh, international and economic development starting to be, to be uh, brought together. So how does this play out in terms of research funding? So funding for research in and for low and middle income countries. Well, as I say, I think there is recognition of the importance of research for sustainable development. And what we're also seeing, I think in many parts of the world is a growing focus on, on equity. So equity in research partnerships, but equity in many parts of society. So if, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement that started in the US and has spread globally, I think we see a, a big focus on this desire for equity, for fairness, um, and we see that in research as well. So whereas traditionally research partnerships may have been very much from the North to the South, there's now a much greater recognition of the value of local knowledge and context. It's not a problem that's been solved, but it's a problem that's, I think, more widely understood, and we're seeing measures being taken to try to develop more equitable relationships. And again, China is very active in, in what we call research geopolitics. So China is active in trade, of course, in, in infrastructure investments, but also is now reaching out much more globally in terms of its research collaborations and, and relationships. And that's changing the research landscape. But again, there are some, I think, some more worrying trends. So we've described there the politicization of science. Um, again, we wrote this before COVID-19, but I think it's, it's come to be proven entirely true if we look at what's happened over the last few months where scientific advisors have been brought very much into the public sphere, have had to kind of give advice to politicians, have been relied on, have been politicized to a much greater extent. But actually, if we look back, this is not a new trend. It's been brought to our attention much more in the last few months, but this is something that was happening previously. And of course, there's risks that go with that in terms of are scientists able to speak out? Are there restrictions on freedom of expression? And that has been a growing concern in the research community in many parts of the world. 
I think economically, it's been a mixed picture over the last few years. So there's been economic growth and there has been increased investment in research in most parts of the world, but starting from a very, very low base. So just to put it into perspective, if we look at the, the OECD countries, which is commonly described as the, the rich man's club, OECD countries spend 2.4% of their gross domestic product on research and development. If we look at the research for life countries, so those in group A, which are the lowest income countries, they spend 0.3% of their GDP on research and development. So this remains, although there are increases in spending, there remains a very, very substantial gap in the level of funding. And that's still a big constraint on research in, in many parts of the world. I think socially, I mentioned the demand for education, I mentioned the demand for, for universities, but in many cases that has been focused on teaching and we haven't yet seen a sort of rapid rise in research productivity and the numbers of researchers in, in low and middle income countries that corresponds with the growth in, in universities. So again, just to, to put that into perspective, in high income countries there's 4,000 researchers for every million people uh, in those countries. In the Group A Research for Life countries, there are 87 researchers per million people. And in the Group B countries, so those with slightly higher levels of income, it's about five or 600 researchers. So there's still much less funding and many fewer researchers relative to the size of the economy and the size of the population in, in many parts of the world. And I think we also see, as I'll come on to show, that's reflected in the levels of, of scholarly output from those regions, which remain very much biased towards the US, to Europe, and increasingly to, to China and, uh, and India in terms of where scholarly uh, outputs are, are coming from. And just in terms of technology, uh, up, sorry, someone just said, can I repeat the, the numbers? So the researchers per million people in high income countries, there are 4,000 researchers per million people. In the Research for Life Group A countries, so that's those with the lowest income, there are 87, only 87 relative to 4,000. So it's a very substantial difference. And all of the figures I'm quoting are in the full report. The link to that is in the chat. So if you want to check any of this, it's all referenced. You can see where that information comes from. Much of it comes from UNESCO data or from the, from the World Bank. So moving on to trends in, in scholarly communication, how does this manifest itself in terms of publishing, in terms of scholarly outputs? Well, I think it's hard to talk about scholarly communication in any context without thinking about, about open access. And I think access has become you know, a more and more of a pressing and a politicized issue in, in recent years. Clearly it's a problem that Research for Life has been working to, to tackle for, for many years. Um, but built on the subscription model. And we're now seeing, I think, more than 50% is, is generally the consensus of, of new articles are available via some form of open access. So there's been talk for quite a while of is, when is the tipping point for open access? Has the tipping point happened? I think it's pretty reasonable to say that we've either passed that tipping point or we're, we're at it at this, at this point in time. So open access is becoming, if it hasn't already, the dominant form of scholarly communication for, for journal publishing at least it is different for, for monographs of, of course um, but I think it's worth saying that that open access movement at least insofar as it tends to attract global attention has been driven largely by high income countries and so many of you will probably have heard of Coalition S and, and Plan S um, which is very much a European centric um, approach to open access, though there are other partners internationally. So the OA movement is gaining ground, but there are questions about how equitable and inclusive that, that is and what a more equitable approach to, to access might look like. And I think it's also really important to acknowledge there are many parts of the world that have been doing open access publishing for, for decades, particularly in, in Latin America, um, which have very different models of, of publishing. So I think economically that move to open access has a tendency to see a shift towards an author pays model. So rather than people paying to read uh, publications, the, the easy way to make it make that flip from an economic perspective is to make the author pay. But of course that brings a number of different challenges in terms of equity. So 
we might be opening up content for people to read, but we could be closing down publishing for, for people to participate and have their voices heard. So I think that's a very pertinent concern. It's one that clearly is, is recognized and, uh, and getting a lot of attention. I know Coalition S, which is the, the group of funders behind Plan S, they commissioned some work recently looking at diamond open access and uh, what models of, of open access might involve where there's no payment on either the reader side or the author side. That's what I mean by, by diamond open access. Um, we've also got UNESCO undertaking a global consultation and looking at a global recommendation on moves to, to open access. So I think we are moving towards a more equitable and inclusive approach to open access, but there's still a significant risk that we inadvertently create barriers to participation in the, the publishing system by moving to, to increase access. I think there's also some very substantial changes going on in the publishing market that are tied to this. So as more content becomes available in open access form, essentially that erodes the value of subscriptions, it erodes publishers' pricing power. So if we look at some of the negotiations, particularly in the US and Europe, but increasingly elsewhere, we are seeing more and more libraries Think about cancelling their big deals with the publishers, um, looking at, well, do we need to continue to, to subscribe? And, and of course, COVID-19 is only going to accelerate that with the, the downward pressure on, on budgets. And we are seeing that more, more globally as well. I think a question about, well, do we need to subscribe to this content? Can we transform existing subscription agreements into open access agreements. So there's a lot of changes in the publishing market. We're also seeing a lot of consolidation and diversification as publishers change their business models, change their approaches in response to this. And we are seeing, I think, subsidized open access publishing models. That's what I referred to as diamond open access. We're seeing that growing um, and particularly growing in, in parts of the world where APCs are just not viable or in disciplines where APCs, that's article publication charges, aren't viable because the funds isn't there, the funding isn't there. So I think that subsidized model where perhaps public actors cover the cost of publishing is gonna become more important, but there are challenges around the scalability of that. And it's not a significant part of, of global output as things stand. Just from a social perspective, I think as you might expect, researchers tend to have very positive attitudes to, to open access when they're readers, everyone wants to read everything but of course, when it comes to publication, people tend to go for the high impact journals, which um, at least until recently have tended to be subscriptions. So we do see a lot of inertia, sort of cultural inertia in, in academia, which I think is one reason why the shift to open access hasn't happened faster than it has. And I think in low and middle income countries, particularly the, the predatory journal issue um, is, is a real problem. I know in, in, in India, this is a real concern in, in other regions as well. So by tying publication to payment, that creates an opportunity for unscrupulous publishers or journals. Um, and so that in turn creates a negative association in some cases between open access and, um, and quality. So generally researchers are positive, but there are some challenges in terms of perceptions of open access and addressing that threat from predatory journals. We're also seeing English as the, public, the language of science coming under threat really for the first time in many, many years with the growth of, of Chinese language publications. So technologically, I mentioned that the open access movement has kind of tended to be dominated recently by high income countries, but from a technological perspective, there's now much more scope for people all over the world to set up open access journals to communicate their, their research um, globally and with open source publishing solutions, with low cost public publishing solutions being available. That infrastructure is starting to be, to be put in place and that in turn, I think, can underpin that sort of subsidized open access publishing model in those areas where a more traditional subscription or APC based model is no longer, is no longer viable. Um, I think tied to that, there will also be a need for, for waivers. Um, so the APC model is gonna be with us for quite some time and it's really important to find ways where people can participate through, through waivers of those APCs where researchers don't have the, the funding. 
I think other trends that we're seeing on a, from a technological but also a social perspective has been growth in, in platforms rather than journals. So is the journal still relevant? Today, it very much is. And I don't think it's going away anytime soon, but we are seeing growth in, in open access platforms. So the African Academy of Sciences, for example, has its own publishing platform. Many funders like Wellcome and Berman and the Gates have their own publishing platforms these days. And also preprint servers. So posting of articles online prior to peer review for, for people to, to read globally. That's been growing in popularity even before COVID-19. It's grown much more rapidly over the last few, last few months. And I think lastly, the role of libraries has been changing. So as people can discover more and more content simply using the internet, there's more personalization of those discovery mechanisms that does call into question the the role of the library and so libraries are having to adapt um, in all parts of the world what is their their offer what is the value they bring to users and, and researchers so what i've tried to do is just give you a sense of those of those trends i think perhaps the the biggest thing i would want to to leave with you is just the growth in in open access so this is a publication that that came out a couple of years ago by um, some American researchers who also run a tool called Unpaywall that tracks uh, open access availability of articles. In the graph on the left, you can see how both the total number of articles have been growing, but also the share of those articles that are open access. So getting close to sort of that 50% threshold by the, the mid 2000s. I think what's particularly interesting if you look at the graph on the on the right is they look to well, what do people actually look at? So not just the number of the number of articles, but what what people go and see and, and view. And they projected that forward to 2025. And what that data is saying is that by by the year 2025, on current trends, and this was pre-COVID-19, of course, 70% plus of all article views will be to to open access content. And I think in lower middle income countries where they're less likely to have subscriptions, that will be probably closer to 75 or even 80%. So we are seeing a very rapid shift to open access. And I think understanding that the balance of views can be different to the, the simple number of articles is really important. So open access articles are attracting more views. And so the total amount of views going to open access is higher than the total number of open access articles. So we're seeing a very rapid transition. I think it's really important to, to understand that. I think just to do a quick update, so I've probably never had a report where the world changed quite so quickly um, between finalizing the text and, uh, and, and getting to, to publication. So what we did seek to do was just have a think about well, what does COVID-19 meant and has that changed any of our findings and uh, so I'm just getting a note saying someone isn't isn't able to hear I, can other people hear me okay maybe just drop me a a note in the chat if not and um, so in terms of the the trends we're seeing okay I think most people can um, what we've seen in the last few few weeks and months, uh, I think at the, at the top level, the ones in blue are just what we're seeing globally. I think we have to recognize we're, we're in a period where governments and state actors are intervening in people's lives in ways that would have been unheard of uh, six to 12 months or so ago. And I think that is going to set a precedent for, for many, many other aspects of society. You know, government is going to play a role in things in a way that it perhaps didn't and people wouldn't have accepted historically. Of course, there's enormous fiscal and monetary risks, so the cost of dealing with the, the pandemic and how public, public spending decisions are influenced by that, the impact on business, all sorts of economic implications. But at the same time, we're seeing kind of technologies, and of course, Zoom is one of those that's you know, shot up in its, in its use, so much more adoption of new technologies of, of necessity. But many of these things, I think the clues were there perhaps beforehand, but it's accelerated the, the adoption and the rate of uptake. In terms of research and scholarly communication, so the, the three points at the bottom, I think there's now much greater value, recognition of the value of scientific research. And potentially this may see more, more money going into research, but of course there's less money overall. So how that's gonna play out is very difficult to know. And it will probably out differently in different parts of the world. I think undoubtedly 
library budgets and university budgets are going to come under significant pressure um, in all parts of the world over the over the next few years so there will be less money i think for for content that in turn is going to put pressure on on publishers who is worth noting in many cases are dealing with rapid growth in submissions at the moment so tied to covid19 but also longer term trends so publishers are going to face real challenges in the in the coming years with less money available but potentially more submissions to to deal with and all of this is as i've said just accelerating that shift to open electronic content rather than, than closed and print resources so just to summarize all of that what are we seeing well, we're seeing that move towards equity and, and different partnerships um, we have been seeing that investment in research and development growing, but still from a low base. More demand for higher education, more talent pool for research, if not more researchers. We're seeing growth in open access publishing infrastructure, but that risk that as technology evolves, we do see a widening digital divide. And COVID-19 itself, I think, again, posing a further threat, threat to, to closing that knowledge gap between high income countries and low and middle income countries. So if you want to, to see more, the, the link is in the chat. You can find that report online. There's also a collaborative version there that you can, that you can take a look at and comment on. So that's everything from me. Thank you very much for, for listening and I'll hand over to, to Tandy at this point. Oh, thank you so much, Rob, uh, uh, for such a nice report. And really, I would like to appreciate the findings because they are very important for researchers like us in uh, low and middle income countries. And for, actually, for the initiatives that are focused on scholarly communications for publishers, as well as for governments and research and higher education institutions, because we really need to to think about and adapt to the changing environment in terms of economy politics, social and technological environment. And first, you are finding sure that there's really growth in terms of LM LMIC's research, which really indicates a high need to, for continued equitable access to, this, to, to our countries. And first, I was also impressed to see that there's public funding that goes along to, the, to, uh, to support the research investments in, in the LMICs. But this also indicates a higher need for the universities and research uh, communities to engage with the industries and communities so that we can also attract funding from other public sector, from other private sectors, since we need to attract more funding so that we do not only depend on the public's uh, funding as uh, only, but we also attract more funding from the private sectors. But also your report showed that uh, the number of researchers who are involved is very low uh, if we look at uh, Although they contribute to the LMIC's research, which also is a call for our governments, it's a call for the research communities and the higher education, so that to see how we can promote these partnerships, even for the uh, development partners, how we can co uh, promote collaboration among the researchers in the global south as well as researchers in the in the north north to south and north to north uh, south to south partnerships, but also. Uh, I've seen that there's a rise in open access, which shows that uh, more there's very positive attitude among researchers in LMICs, and they engage in open access. But the report also shows that most researchers, perhaps they are not aware, they are still vulnerable, and they publish to the predatory uh, channels, which show that we really need to build capacity and to create awareness to LMIC researchers, researchers so that they know which journals are really open access and where to publish. And also the, uh, from the findings, we are also seeing that uh, we need also to improve the quality of our repositories as well as our journals, because we, we saw that most researchers are not depositing their research outputs into their repositories, but they end up into the predatory journal. So we need really to build uh, capacity as well as awareness on the importance of the open access. And then uh, we have seen also changes in terms of search and discovery workflows, which really shows that we need to improve this experience. And given that our capacity is not that enough, if we improve this experience and personalization of content discovery tools, especially for publishers, for initiatives involved in scholarly communications, for the research communities, we really will improve the way our researchers at LMISs engage in research, engage in publishing, and engage in 
how they access their research. And then the impact of COVID-19, actually we are seeing a lot of increased use of technology in, in our countries, which has never been before, because we have a lot of challenges in terms of uh, infrastructure, in terms of capacity, in terms of skills, but in terms of also devices, and also the electricity may not be reliable to some parts. So this is a call to all of us, to our governments, to the uh, publishers, that, to the initiatives, mainly focusing on square communication, to improve our our platform so that we can improve the user experience and be able to engage more researchers from LMICs, but also to provide equitable access to research content. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Andrea. Yes. There we are. Yeah, thank you very much, Tandy, for those uh, thoughts and reflections on how the findings that Rob has described in such interesting detail um, really sort of play out in, in your country, Tanzania, and in maybe many other lower and middle income countries. Uh, so it's terrific um, <coughs> pleasure to have you joining us today. So for the, the final section before we move into q and I'm delighted to welcome Sean Harris. Um, Sean is a communication specialist from INASP um, and has many, many years of experience working in scholarly communication in lower and middle income countries and some of the, the issues that affect that. Um, INASP, as I mentioned earlier, has been contracted by Research for Life to carry out the final phase of the review program, the user review, and she's going to just give us a little bit of background to that, a little bit of um, information about where we where we are now and how um, how the, the the findings of the landscape analysis will play out uh, in the context of the user review. So I'm going to move the slides for you, Sean. All okay. yours. Thank you very much, um, Andrea, for the introduction. So. Um, as Andrea mentioned earlier, uh, Research for Life carries out user reviews every five years to understand what users like and don't like about the programmes um, and to inform future developments. So many common themes have occurred over past reviews and are being explored again in our study. Perspectives on the breadth of content, accessibility of the platform, um, and the factors that affect that, um, many of the things that Tandy has um, spoken about particularly. Um, also issues like awareness of the initiative and availability and usefulness of training. But as Rob and Tandy both shared, Research for Life doesn't exist in isolation. It is part of a global context with different political factors within countries, changes in the research and higher education landscape, shifts in policies regarding external research funding, and the ongoing rise in content being available, made available either by approved open access channels or via unauthorized channels. Um, and the landscape can of course change a lot in five years um, in terms of, for example, local staff changes, meaning greater or less awareness of research for life, shifting national policies or economic status may impact whether a publisher provides resources to a particular country. And there can be of course global trends in research publishing other factors as we've been hearing uh, this year of course in particular we're all aware of changes due to the COVID-19 pandemic and this adds an extra dimension to the study so on this slide now um, what are we doing so to try and capture as much as possible of the nuance we've been discussing earlier in this webinar in our study we are taking a mixed methods approach, um, similar to the kind of approach that Rob talked about. We started with a desk review of previous reviews and other relevant studies. The stage we are at the moment is at the first bullet point on this slide. We are conducting many, many interviews with researchers, librarians and others across, across 12 countries. Um, these countries are across um, several continents and they're a mixture of um, the Research for Life Group A countries and the Group B countries. I should note here that we are not a, ourselves not immune to pandemic impacts so past user reviews have involved research teams traveling to meet with people in person. Um, obviously limitations to travel have meant that our interviews have taken place taken a different approach. So what we've been doing is we've established 
Um, there was a good question here. I only see 11 countries in your list. Uh, I may well have missed a country and my apologies to that country and I will, I will check which one after this, um, this call, my apologies. Um, so we have, we are doing 12 countries and yes, we've, we've got a network of interviewers around the world who we've matched by language and time zones and then we're conducting interviews as, as we're all working at the moment via Zoom, Skype and WhatsApp, depending on the technical preferences of the interviewees. Our next step will be a survey which will be taking place during August and have a deadline of the 7th of September. Details will be shared on the Research for Life website and social media, as well as through other channels. We would really like as wide and deep a sample of users and potential users as possible. So if you're eligible for or involved in Research for Life, please do consider completing the survey and please help us. So there was a question there that, that just popped up and I missed it. Um, can uh, maybe maybe um, if you could ask that question at the end, and I can um, I can try and reply then. If that would be okay. Um, so we'd really like people as much as possible to fill in this survey and to share it as well. It will be available in English, French, and Spanish. Uh, the final component of our study, in parallel to the survey. Ah, oh, yes, of course, it is Vietnam. It's Vietnam is the missing country, and my apologies to Vietnam. Um, I was, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so we are going to be doing national level case studies in two edition. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not ready quite for the next slide yet. Andrea, thank you. Um, my, we're going to be doing two national level case studies in two additional countries. So additional to the 12 above. Um, those will be Kenya and Honduras. If there is anyone in the audience from either of those countries, we'd be really interested to hear your perspective if you'd be interested in participating. So my email address was on the first slide. And, and then the final thing to say is that the findings will be shared at next year's Research for Life meeting. Could I have the last slide now? My last slide, please, Andrea. So this is an intense and exciting project to be part of especially in such an unusual time. I am one of the researchers involved, but as I mentioned when I discussed the interviewer, interviews, we are actually quite a large and very international team. So this slide is a quick shout out to all of the people involved um, in the interviewing and case studies. Uh, so there's people from the UK, but also from Mexico, Brazil, Bangladesh, India, Egypt, Ukraine, Zimbabwe, and Argentina. And in addition, research consulting is taking an advisory role to ensure consistency with the other recent studies. If you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them, as would my colleague uh, Femi Nazegwu, who is leading this study and is also on the call. Thank you very much, and please look out for the survey. Thank you very much, Sham. Um, we do now have a few moments, five minutes or so, for questions and answers. Um, what I can do is start with the question that I think popped up and you, and you missed there, Sham. Um, this is from Kate Nyan, and she asks, will the study participants be Research for Life users or people at Research for Life institutions, whether they use it or not, or people in Research for Life countries, whether their institutions participate or not? In other words, will you be able to explore the barriers that limit use? Uh, that, is, that is very much our, our hope. So um, we've been trying to get in terms of the countries that we're doing interviews and in terms of the institutions we've been selecting a balance of institutions that use research for life a lot and institutions that um, don't use research for life so much the particular focus for trying to get um, insight from non-users will be the survey and we are very much hoping to get some good insights and would really appreciate people sharing with people who don't use research for life to try and understand a bit more about whether this is because of maybe because of awareness because of technical issues because of 
um, issues with content or whatever other sorts of sort of issues. So these are the kind of questions that the survey will be asking. Um, and we haven't sent the survey out yet, so we've had no response to that, but we are hoping for a lot of responses from a whole range of different people. Mm. We've had another question from Eliana, who, who also previously asked about the appropriateness of the APC model uh, for lower and middle income countries. And Rob, you, you responded to Eliana, it might be worth responding um, for the benefit of, of others who may not have seen that question. Yeah, by all means, I think it's a really good, it's a really good question. And I, I think, you know, I, I find in, we do a lot of different pieces of, of work in, in the research landscape and something that kind of comes up over and over again is there is no one size fits all solution. So we've got to take account of national and, and regional differences, but also disciplinary differences. And, and I think it's, you know, the APC model is fairly well established in sort of biomedical research where there tends to be more, more funders willing to support it. I think it just doesn't work anything like as well in in arts and humanities from a disciplinary perspective and as you rightly suggest it's much more challenging um, for lower middle income countries so I, I think there's sort of two answers to the question so one is making sure that if there's uh, an APC based model that there are also measures that go with that to maintain equity of access so having waivers for APCs is as I mentioned really really key there I think also looking at mechanisms where the author themselves don't, doesn't have to find the money per publication. So the use of transformative agreements or changing existing subscription relationships, um, where those are in place, which isn't, of course, the case in many of the Research for Life countries, but where those are in place, repurposing them to essentially enable authors to, to pay for, for, to publish for free. So I think the APC model does have a place and there are ways that some of those challenges with it can be overcome, but it can't be the only solution. So we need to keep a place for other approaches, which might be a sort of subsidized or diamond open access publishing model. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, as I've said before, has had a lot of success in Latin America and is growing in, in other parts of the world. But I think also, you know, the growth in preprints that we've we've seen uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it may slacken off, but you know, that is a very significant trend. So a few people have been suggesting for some time, you know, does everything need to be published in a, in a journal or is it possible to share research as a preprint and only that research which gains attention or seems to be particularly significant then goes through a formal publication process. There's lots of challenges and, and problems with that, but I think my, my point is that we need a diversity of approaches and we need approaches that aren't just dreamt up by people sitting in London or Oxford or Boston or, or Amsterdam. We need that diversity of approaches um, and that, that takes account of local contexts and needs and disciplinary contexts and needs. Thank you, Rob. There's another question here from Eliana also about um, the role of Research for Life in the context of the uh, potential uh, widening digital divide that you described earlier. And of course, Research for Life's primary mission is to facilitate access to research content. So that was how it was established and, and it really continues to be its main focus. But of course, we also see it as a capacity development platform. We provide quite a lot of training around Research for Life, um, educating researchers in lower and middle income countries how to assess access and digest and analyze the research publications that are available to them. So helping researchers to understand what makes a good research article, um, which journals publish in their subject area, how to engage with other researchers um, in their community. Um, these are all aspects of the training that we offer. And of course, Research for Life needs to adapt as well as it moves forward, depending on the needs of the users. And this is very much why we carry out these studies. So I think Research for Life continues to have a core role in providing barrier-free access to information, but has the potential to become a broader capacity development platform as well. So there's a question here about uh, accessed reports to past user surveys. Um, we have published the um, executive summaries of previous user surveys. Um, they are usually, they're available on request. Um, and I can 
check after this meeting and send out an email um, to let you know where those might be available as well online. Another interesting question about whether Research for Life is considering access to research objects, so not just articles and preprints, but also code, data and data analysis tools. Well, that's jolly interesting. Um, and actually, some of the recent resources that we've been adding to the Research for Life system have gone beyond just providing um, access, just, just primary research journals. So um, databases, reference resources um, are also now accessible through Research for Life. Um, so that that adds value. We, we, uh, we don't host any data or, uh, or code on the platform currently, um, but these are good um, questions for us to put into the mix for as we think about future expansion or potential expansion of the programme. So th thank you for raising that question. So there we are, Cam Kimberly Parker from WHO. Thank you very much, Kim, has responded to that earlier point that each of the strategic plans that we've published includes summaries of past reviews, which are available on the Research for Life website. Um, final question, maybe in looking at the time from Nina Chachu is asking, what skills and competencies that um, knowledge librarians in LMIC should have? Well, gosh, there's a uh, $64 million question. Um, Maybe librarians in the audience uh, would like to comment on that question. Um, I'm sure there are uh, challenges around negotiation skills, um, negotiating access to content where it's not available um, at low cost or for free through your institution, um, helping researchers navigate uh, the very rich, rich information discovery environment that, uh, that exists now, so training researchers on how to best access and, and understand and um, assess the quality of various research resources, um, that another area. One area that we found in the past that has been uh, important is the advocacy skills of librarians. And in fact, we provide an advocacy toolkit through the Research for Life website that helps librarians explain the role of information to their peers and maybe their administrators and, and managers within their own institutions, making the case for um, institutional support for the library and its programs. So do take a look at the advocacy toolkit that's available through the Research for Life website. Yes, I don't know if Tandy has any uh, anything to add to that particular point. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. I think as librarians, we need to adapt to the changing environment, especially the technology because now books are not only hosted in our libraries, but we need to deal with the online ebooks and online journals and how we can use, um, enhance, uh, build capacity to our users so that they can have access to those resources. And also how to deal with the catalogs, online catalogs, providing from online information services. So it's a wide range of uh, knowledge and skills that we need, especially to deal with the different types of data, of knowledge, as well as of information uh, materials. Thank you, Tandy. So I'm going to draw today's webinar to a close. I'd like to thank once again our speakers today, Rob and Sean and Tandy, for really a very interesting and informative session. Um, I, I learn something new every time I hear this uh, presentation. Um, so um, thank you. We do look out for um, the, the, the report. Uh, the link is provided in the chat if you want to go and have a, a deep dive into it and look at uh, the, 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 the detail of what was presented to you in, in summary today. Um, and for those of you who will be attending the Research for Life General Partners meeting in a couple of weeks, very much look forward to seeing you there and to interacting with you again. So thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.